Hello. Uh, welcome back to our course on uh, electrical power quality. So this is Professor Umar Rao from RV College of Engineering, Bangalore, bringing you the lectures on electrical power quality under the VTU e Sikshana program. So in the last class, last session, I had uh, spoken to you about distribution planning and how to consider power quality in distribution planning. So we saw various aspects of planning and the two types of planning. One is the conventional planning where cost is the main criteria and a competitive planning where risk also has to be considered. Then we saw a flow, flow chart for how we are going to assess the cost. So the cost will take care of the power quality costs and uh, the cost of operation, maintenance, etc. Then we saw the modeling aspects where for capacity building, you can model the three phase system on a single phase basis. Whereas for fault analysis, you need to model the system in detail. Okay. And then we saw how the fault uh, can be analyzed. So we simulate different kinds of faults and find out the effect on each fault on the different protective devices and evaluate which is the worst fault and what is the strategy for that. Then for power quality mitigation, we saw that we have to evaluate the cost for different solutions and finally pick up the optimal cost. So, now we will see what are the technologies available for distributed generation. So what is this concept? What is this concept of distributed generation? So please be careful. DG is used for diesel gen sets and also for distributed generation. So in this context, DG stands for distribution generation. See, in our conventional power system, the generators are located far away from the load centers. And the generators were of huge capacity, 1000 megawatt plants, 500 megawatt plants, 2000 megawatts plants, and so on. So the three main uh, ways of generating power was through thermal plants, that is coal-based, hydro plants, water-based, and nuclear plants. As solar PV technology and wind technology picked up, the possibility of having a distributed generation came into existence. See, if I want to build a hydel plant, obviously I will have it where there is a water source near a river. And a thermal plant, I will have it where I can transport coal easily. That's why you see many plants are located in coastal areas because we can transport the coal. Whereas solar and wind, they opened up huge opportunities for setting up this, for setting up generation at any location where there is solar and wind power existing. So this gave to the concept of distributed generation because it is distributed around the area, not concentrated in one center. That is the first thing. The second thing is the voltages, especially in solar, the voltages are not very high, right? So with low voltage, we started generating at the customer level. So it became a generation now became or is becoming slowly, I can't say became, is becoming a part of the distribution system and, it's not, and has ceased to be an entity by itself. So we are right now, we are having both. So that is how the word distribution came into existence. The second reason for distributed generation is the entry of private parties in power generation. If you look at conventional power plants, they require huge investments. 
So investors do not have that kind of money to invest on mega power plants. So most of the generation plants are owned by government. They're owned by government. Now, what if an investor, investor has lesser money and would like to set up a small thermal plant, say of 100 megawatts? So for this, the private parties came into existence and that also gave rise to distributed uh, generation. Now to ease the burden on the utilities to invest on capacity building, in, in my last session, I spoke at length excessively on uh, capacity building. So to reduce the investment on capacity uh, building, government uh, in India and governments across the world gave a lot of subsidies to people investing in renewable energy sources. So renewable energy sources mean the source of this electrical power, the prime source is nature, wind, solar, primarily, which is renewable. Okay. So all DG need not be renewable. For example, if you have a diesel generator set, that is not a renewable source because you're going to use diesel. A gas-based thermal plant is not renewable because you're going to use natural gas. But a solar plant is renewable. A hydel plant is renewable. A wind plant is renewable. A biogas is renewable. Okay. So this, the renewable systems are where the source of energy is renewable, infinite. But some distribution generations, like even battery, you can think of it as a distributed generation. It, though it is a storage, it can be used fuel cells. These are all distributed because they're distributed across the customer's network, but they're not renewable. So all distributed generation need not be renewable. And all renewable need not be distributed also. You can have bulk wind farm. That may not, that need not be a distribution somewhere. Okay. Now why this uh, focus on renewable energy uh, now, first is they emit zero or very low greenhouse gases. So today, you know, climate change is a big issue. And uh, people are saying that a lot of, uh, you know, what we are having, tsunamis, tornadoes, storms, all these are because of climate change, global warming. And recently we had North America and Canada go to crazy heats, 50 degrees, 50 degrees centigrade, which was not heard of at all. So all this is because of the greenhouse gases. They upset the atmospheric laser layers, the ozone layers, and cause excessive heating in atmosphere. So our temperatures go up. Okay. So renewable energy sources, what way if we generate electricity using renewable energy, they emit uh, very low greenhouse gases. And so they're considered to be very good. Pollution. If you have gone near a thermal plant, you will find that there is a permanent exhaust of black, blackish fumes going, you know. So it causes a lot of pollution. Whereas renewable energy sources, again, emit zero or very low air pollutants. This is very good for the health, health of the people. And uh, the costs have come down. And you have renewable energy, the generation can be in a wide range. You can have a solar panel of 5 watts or 10 watts, or you can have a solar farm of 1000 megawatts or 2000 megawatts. So that range is unimaginable. Clear? It gives a lot of flexibility. So we can bring down energy prices to affordable levels. Initially, when solar PV was started in 1950s, the efficiency was very low. But today, efficiencies have reached significant amounts with uh, you know newer materials and newer technologies. So we have efficiencies of almost 30%, which is pretty good, 30 to 35% we have achieved and people are hoping it will go higher. And the raw material is free. 
So it works out to be cheaper. The energy cost works out to be uh, cheaper. And renewable energy creates jobs in the local community because it is at the customer's level. Okay, so people can invest and you can create jobs. So you can have community jobs. And it makes the energy market resilient, it means flexible. The energy market becomes flexible. It's no longer the energy market is no longer in the hands of a few big players who can manipulate the energy prices, who can manipulate the energy prices, right? So this resilience is good and uh, can improve the reliability of the uh, system. And renewable energy is accessible for all, right? Let us say I'm somewhere in a hilltop and it's not possible to draw a line. The area, geographical area is uh, inaccessible. You know how difficult it is to provide the uh, uh, power in hill stations. You have to draw the transmission lines and distribution lines via mountains. Very bad uh, geographical surfaces. But renewable energy makes it accessible to all. Right? It's very good for economic development. It's very good for economic development. And as I told you, the energy source is not depleted. And renewable energy is democratic because the community is involved, people accept it. So it is good for acceptance. So what are the technologies uh, uh, we see? And what are the perspectives? How different players or stakeholders in the energy market, how do they view uh, distributed generation technologies? First, the end user perspective, that is the customer perspective. So as I told you, the distributed generation brings the generation to the customer's doorstep. And this is what adds maximum value to the DG, that is a distributed uh, generation. So the end users, okay, uh, who pay a very high value to power electricity, for them these DGs provide a very viable alternative backup option to provide improved reliability, to provide improved reliability, right. Now we have very high efficient applications such as combined heat and power. So this can help small industries, local industries. So where you have heat and power generation, these are called as cogeneration, combined uh, application. So then your energy bill is reduced, right? I'm generating electrical power and the heat generated from this process, I use it in another process. So my total energy here, energy means not just electricity energy, the energy, the heat, and the cost of the heat energy. So the net energy will come down to the customer. So though domestic customers cannot make use of this, but industrial customers definitely, yes. This sort of a distributed generation uh, very successfully brings down their costs. Now, another thing is as a customer, if I have money to invest in a small generation, I can sell it to the bigger utility and ask for compensation. And now why should utility buy from me? Because utility does not want to invest. So say, let us say, uh, it costs, uh, it, uh, we have a require, requirement um, of uh, say a thousand crores for investing in a power plant. So we can, we can have, you know, we can split that investment into smaller parties who each of them can sell the power to the utility. So the, there are two advantages with it. The utility does not have to invest and the person investing will also make back money. That's the second advantage. The third advantage is in this way, way you can overcome the problem of power shortages. So there are multiple benefits with smaller power generations in the hands of larger 
number of people. The only problem is if you want to integrate all that, synchronization may be a problem. If we continue going in for AC systems. However, if we switch over to low power DC systems, this problem also will not arise. Now, what is the interest of the distribution utility? That is the distribution companies, the discoms, the distribution companies. They are, what is the objective of a distribution company? They have to sell electrical power to the end users. I have BESCOM. What is the objective of BESCOM? To sell power to Bangalore, Bangalore people, right? So they all the distribution companies already have a TND structure, infrastructure. That means the transmission and distribution structure. So these additional generation can be used for capacity release. So they are also happy because their investment is deferred, right? So this is good till the load is met by this DG, if the load increases even more, then maybe the utility has to invest in that. This is called as hedging. Hedging means how you reduce your risk. How you reduce your risk. As I told you in the previous session, if my average demand is 500 and my projected peak demand is 800 megawatts, do I invest in 300 megawatt capacity building? Okay, that's a question mark. What if the load doesn't increase? So we hedge against the risk of bad investment by you know, in asking the customers to invest in distributed generation, right? And this can also keep a check on price hikes because there are a number of players. So this is the perspective of the uh, distribution company uh, towards DG, distributed generation. Now we have a commercial power producer perspective. So the customer has a source, distributed generation as a backup. The utility encourages it because they want to hedge against the risk of excessive or bad investment or a forecast error in projection. There are a third group, they're investors, commercial power producers. As I told you, you know, they want to aggregate the power. See, I'm, I'm having a solar rooftop of 10 kilowatts. My neighbor has another 10 kilowatts. Somebody else has five kilowatts. And there is one small thermal plant in our community of 50 uh, kilowatts. And somebody has invested on a 100 kilowatt uh, gas-based uh, plant, so on. They can't sell it, you know, because the costs may go up and there may be a lot of technical issues. So what these commercial power producers can do is they'll aggregate. They will aggregate and make it into one unit. It's like, a, like you know, if you want to have a mango mandi, all the people who sell mangoes will come to the mandi and it is one aggregated unit. It's like that, right? So they're called as virtual power plants. They're called as virtual power plants. So what is a virtual power plant? A virtual power plant is an aggregation of smaller distributions, an aggregation of smaller distributions. Now this, this virtual power plant can supply for a local community, a local area, or they can sell it to the main, main grid. So you can have uh, integrated or interconnected to the grid, or you can also have off-grid. So in off-grid, you don't have the problem of interconnection, but you must have capacity to supply the local community need. Okay. So these are the different perspectives and uh, how it is going to affect the different stakeholders, the customer, the power producer, and the utility. Now, DJ does have some disadvantages. One is poor power quality. One of the reasons for this is that 
almost all the distributed generation technologies, they use power electronics and power electronic devices like rectifiers, inverters, etc. They, they cause a lot of power quality problems. You have already seen it in the previous chapters. This is one of the main problems with distributed generation. The second problem is, of course, since the customer or the consumer is installing, if the consumer installs, or even if an industry installs, the end user, then the cost and maintenance has to be borne by the end user. That is another problem. The third problem is reliability, not reliability of the system. The reliability of the system improves with distributed generation. The reliability of the product itself, of the technology itself. If I use solar, what if it rains? Okay, what if suddenly a storm comes and I don't have power generation? Solar PV sleeps for uh, three or four days, right? So that reliability is lessened. The fourth problem is interconnection. If I want to take the distributed generation and integrate it to the grid, it will cause some problem because I have to uh, synchronize, etc. So these are the main uh, disadvantages of distributed generation. So people who want to oppose it would, would quote one of these. But on the whole, I would say globally, there is a lot of scope and encouragement for distributed generation. So if you Google distributed generation, normally you will find two uh, representations. This is the first one. The DG owners, small time players. Okay, let us say an industry. So look at the grid. The grid is shown as a big rectangular block. And look at the generation, local generation is a small generator. Right? So the size, the, the, it's intentionally drawn to show that, to indicate that the DG power is very small compared to the grid. This is what will happen in small players especially domestic players. So they can use the whatever they're generating to meet their own load. And then if there is excess, they can try to sell it to the grid. The second one is what I told you, you know, utilities. They're not, it's not a small customer, right? So somebody has Adani, Adani has a lot of money to invest and invests on a 2000 megawatt solar plant. Look at this. So the DG is huge, very big circle compared to the local substation power, whatever power is available in the local substation. This is not the whole grid. Huh? This is whatever is available locally at that area. So now you see the sizes are reversed. The DG is much larger compared to the utility. So these are distribution utilities. So the DG is substantial. They have to do interconnection. They have to connect it to the grid and then because they may not have a local demand at all for such huge uh, uh, generation. There's a Thum in near uh, Thumkur, Paugada. There's a 2000 megawatt plant. Who is going? That area doesn't require 2000 megawatt. So when you have such large distribution utilities, you have to integrate it with the grid and transport it. Transport it. So you'll have to step up the voltage. You have to step up the voltage and transport it to other places because the power generated is huge. Here. Yeah. So the distributed generation could be of small values, which can feed local loads and where you can have interconnection or you need not have and larger uh, generations where you have to integrate it with the grid. So what are the technologies uh, we have? So these are Cummins uh, reciprocating engine gen sets. So you have an engine and an alternator. Okay, so the engine is the prime mover. So these are some uh, commercial products which I have put. So this is uh, from Cummins power uh, generation. So what we are going to see is what are the different technologies we have for distributed generation. So reciprocating engines, this is the least uh, expensive. So, uh, they're reciprocating gas or diesel engines. And uh, normally they can be like what you see here, 
these can be mounted on uh, trailers and they can be moved around they can be moved around okay so you it you can have it like a thermal uh, like a mobile plant mobile power plant if you mount it on uh, trailers so let us say there is a total blackout right and you in, in a particular area now you are all even the auxiliary power bank everything has uh, you know exhausted and now you have to revive the system to revive the system i need energy so we can use mobile gensets for that this is okay i'm just giving you one application or there is an island you can have mobile uh, gensets right and uh, the other uses they can provide support during emergencies suddenly there is an unforeseen power spike power demand has increased so in such cases to meet emergencies uh, you can have and uh, they can be placed in a substation and interconnected to the local substation now if we are going to produce around 480 volts we have to step it up when we integrate and uh, this uh, reciprocating engine based uh, gensets they can be used to meet demands in local areas now the technology is very mature and uh, cost has come down and compared to gas and diesel gas based plants are good as a investment entity but diesel based engines are very good for local customers so you will see whenever you go to a mall when the power goes off you will start hearing a loud sound all the diesel generator sets will be up you can have it in apartments okay normally individual houses we don't have but you can have in apartments you can have in commercial uh, complexes and you can have uh, a group of shops in an area can have and so on so diesel gensets have uh, become a very popular backup source however these are very high in nitrous oxide and uh, sulfuric oxide emissions x would be monoxide dioxide emissions and therefore their hour of usage is limited you can't use it where you want power 24 bar 7 throughout the year i can't use this so there is a limitation because uh, of their uh, gases i told you this is not renewable this is not a renewable source of dg because you are using diesel and you are using gas so it's not renewable but it is dg and uh, because of its limited uh, hours of usage it's difficult to use these plants for base load because base load is there all the time so they are preferred for peak load or for emergency backup suddenly it goes off and uh, the gas based gas based engines are less polluting compared to diesel based and they are very popular in combined heat and power generation in schools commercial i told you to schools commercial buildings campuses etc so these engines are prime movers they are the prime movers and they are normally connected to synchronous generators or induction generators if the power is less than 300 kilowatts you can use induction generators otherwise alternators are uh prefer and uh, they they do have a consistent performance over their life cycle and uh, they can be used under a wide range of environmental uh, conditions efficiency is okay around 40% efficiency they do have and uh, they are less sensitive to ambient conditions compared to combustion turbines where the power efficiency will decrease as the temperature rises but the exhaust of turbines is higher so turbines are preferred to engines when it comes to a combined heat and power application okay so that is the first uh, uh, type of distributed generation the next type is combustion gas turbines so this is from gear petrol so in a combustion gas turbine you have reactants of combustion 
oxidizer and a fuel and these serve as the working fluid for the engine so these engine combustion engines they gain energy from the heat released during the combustion of non reacting working fluids that is the oxidizer and the fuel itself they, they should not react so they are widely used and uh, you can generate powers around 1 to 10 megawatts uh, and the speeds are around 8000 to 12000 rpm of these engines and uh, we have to gear it down because normally the generators the speed is around 1800 or 3600 that is if you take a 60 hertz frequency if you take 50 hertz frequency the speed would be 1500 to 3000 rpm so these are uh, popularly used up to around 10 megawatts and they use natural gas or liquid fluids and uh, in this category we have micro turbines another prime mover so it's a type of combustion turbine that produces both heat and electricity in a small scale so they have a smaller number of moving parts they are compact lightweight they have a good efficiency lower emissions lower energy cost and you have an opportunity to utilize waste fuels so because the fuel waste is recovered that is the heat is recovered they have a efficiency of almost the entire cycle efficiency is around 80% which is pretty high and uh, they are normally used in the range of 25 to 500 kilowatts so the fuel used is natural gas or hydrogen or propane or diesel so these installations are clean and they are compact so you only have one turbine one small turbine with a permanent magnet rotor so the typical range is from around 10000 to 100000 at year so the output is rectified and then inverted and interfaced with the grid if necessary or you can invert it and use it directly for the loads these turbines so this is a, 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 a an a sample turbine i have given you can parallel them also and increase the power capacity up to around 400 kilowatts they are called as mini turbines okay so just the efficiency of the turbine alone is around 30% and but if you include include the efficiency including the heat recovery it is it can go as high as 80% and it is best suited for heat and power applications uh and not not advisable for domestic purpose not at all meant for that but for small scale and medium scale uh, industries and commercial establishments it's a good option and uh, they also are very environment friendly and therefore they can be used as backup or standby generators standby keep it by so if the utility fails immediately use it and rarely they are also used as base load applications for a, a, a commercial establishment or a small community etc and you have uh, with different fuels the turbines designed for different fuels and you can also extract um energy using mini and micro turbines from biomass gas flare gas or natural gas and where you save on the transportation local biomass gas if you want to transport somewhere through a pipeline you waste a lot of money instead you can have a small uh, micro turbine and uh, you can generate mm -hmm. your own electricity so that it's very good for farms you know in the farms where they have uh, um dairy like uh, cows buffaloes etc so you have a lot of cow dung the dung can be used to generate biogas and you can have it uh, with a small uh, micro turbine you can generate uh, electricity enough to sustain the farm the third uh, technology available today is the fuel cell fuel cells are like batteries they have an anode and a cathode only thing is they don't require charging they don't discharge 
So as long as the fuel is fed, they produce electricity. One of the most uh, popular fuel cells uses uh, hydrogen to produce electricity in a clean manner. So if we use hydrogen, then the output of the entire process is electricity, water, heat. You see how friendly it is. No gas emitted, no pollutant, right? No greenhouse gas. And they're unique in the sense that they have a wide variety of applications. Starting from you can use it in small laptops to big establishments. So like solar PV, they have a wide range, wide range. Uh, and can provide for power systems as large as a utility power station or as small as a laptop computer. So it's a very beautiful uh, upcoming uh, technology. So a simple fuel cell uh, will have two electrodes, a negative anode and a positive cathode sandwiched in between you have an electrolyte similar to a battery, something similar to a battery. A fuel is such as hydrogen is fed to the anode and air is fed to the cathode, okay? So in a hydrogen fuel cell, we have a catalyst at the anode, which will separate the hydrogen molecules into protons and electrons. The electrons will go out into the outer circuit as electricity and the protons migrate to the cathode where they will unite with oxygen and produce water and heat. This is a, I've given a very simple picture for you to understand. So this is one, one example of us how a simple fuel cell will work. Uh, the main disadvantage of this fuel cell today is its cost. However, there's a lot of research going on and it is hoped that the cost will be brought down. So you see here, there are different, uh, these are all different fuel cells installed. The first one is by uh, Orlicon. I'm just, I have put different pictures to show you the size, how the size can vary. And the second one is by Bloom Energy. And the third one is by Toyato. Toyoto. And uh, as I told you, you know, such huge systems can be used uh, as a support to a substation. Okay. And it, they can also be used for very small applications like a laptop. So we have seen three technologies today and the uh, uh, concept of um, uh, distributed generation and its perspective uh, from a customer's viewpoint, uh, from a utility viewpoint and from an investor's viewpoint. So we will uh, consider more technologies in the next session.